Welcome, ladies and gentlemen and students. Uh, it's great to have you here on what is our third in our series of uh, D&T Futures lectures. This evening, we're delighted to be able to introduce you to someone probably familiar to everyone here, I suspect. Familiar as an individual who has a background in design and building things, but who can now also claim celebrity status. Um, <coughs> perhaps through entertaining us uh, with his engaging television programs. The past two lectures have each focused on different aspects of design. Wayne Hemingway, concentrating mainly on design of fashion and clothing. Dick Powell, more recently, covering a wide variety uh, of, from product, industrial, through to transport and service design. This evening, we're going to hear from someone who shares, also shares that passion for design and that passion for improving the quality of life and improving the quality of the world we live in, and doing this through design, in particular, through the design of buildings and spaces. I'll leave it to George to fill in the journey that's taken uh, him, uh, a journey that's resulted in him becoming a household name associated particularly with buildings and TV series, including The Dream Home Abroad, Restoration Man, The Great British Property Scandal, George Clark's Amazing Spaces, and of course, for all good D&T teachers, Shed of the Year. We all have one, don't we? Or a virtual one, if not. It is, of course, through building and spaces and the spaces that they create that we all constantly interact with the outcomes of design and design and technology. Whether that is in the spaces we occupy when we're studying and working, the places we go to enjoy recreation, or indeed the homes and houses in which we live. It's with respect to the latter that George, I know, is particularly passionate. He said recently, we should be building houses like we build cars. I think he had in Callum in mind, Jaguar, chief designer. Controlled environments, huge amounts of research and development, high levels of quality control. We need to build better and more efficiently and stop building noddy houses on the green belt. George, we're delighted to welcome you here this evening. We're so grateful that you would give us your time to um, come and talk to us. And we're also um, really looking forward, I'm sure, to asking questions, asking you questions. Uh, so if you have questions already, if you've thought about them, uh, I'm going to give you the opportunity. We'll get as many of those out of the audience as we can when George is finished. George Clark, welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, can we dim the lights a little bit? Can we dim the lights a little bit? It's very bright, isn't it? Just trying to be ecologically friendly. Just, just a tiny bit, I think. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a talk that I've, I've never given before. Um, and I hope you don't mind. It will be slightly autobiographical at the beginning. Um, and I've done that intentionally because uh, when I was briefed up about the event, um, I was asked a lot about, well, how did that happen? And how did you get into that? And where did that start? And how did you get into television? And, and I just thought, I think I'm going to have to do a talk that I've never really done before. Normally, I tend to just talk about the work, or I'll jump on my bandwagon and have a whinge about politics and building and housing policy. Um, but I have decided to make this slightly autobiographical at the beginning. We're going to, if I don't talk for too long, um, we should leave more time, I think, to do questions and have a conversation. Because what I don't like doing is just preaching to you for 50 minutes and telling you how I think things should be. Um, I think architecture and design and technology should be a bit more of a debate than me just preaching. So I might be fairly swift on some of the slides so that we can get to a stage where we can ask questions and um, have more of a chat. I think it'd be better. I'll just skim through these. So it's, it's kind of life in the architecture game and the building game with a little bit of telly thrown in for good measure. Um, this is an embarrassing shot of me in that blue tracksuit, um, sitting there with my granddad, who you can see in the middle, uh, my nan, my sister, and my auntie off to the side. Uh, this is quite an important picture for me in some ways. 
uh, because my granddad, my granddad was without a doubt the biggest influence for me in my life. He was a builder. Uh, he was no master craftsman. Uh, he probably wasn't too proud of some of the concrete tower blocks that he built up in the north in the 1960s. But he's, he's such an amazing man, actually, uh, to be a working class guy who kind of pushed muck around, uh, worked on the A66, worked on the A69. He had hands about four times the size of mine. Um, and he was brilliant. He used to, he was quite a traditionalist, but he was a good teacher, and I don't think he realized how good a teacher he was. Uh, he told me never to read novels. <laughs> Pointless. Just dreamers and poets read novels. Don't do that. Um, he would make me watch documentaries on television as an education. Uh, even at the age when I was 12 years old, he bought me, because um, by then I wanted to be an architect, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, Sunderland Library had a book sale, and he went down there and bought every single book on building and construction, architecture and design for me, and came back with a stack of them. One of them, which was the, um, the glossary of architectural terms, which... I sat and read through one Easter holiday from A to Z, all the way through for every single word associated with architecture. That's how much of a geek I was, even at the age of 12. Um, but one of the thing that stuck with me more than anything, he said to me, um, when you walk around the street, when you walk down the street, when you go down to the town, don't walk around with your head down. What he actually said was, don't walk around with your head down like all the other Muppets on the estate, but I shouldn't really say that. Um, he said, don't walk around with your head down, keep your head up, and look at the world around you. That stuck with me for the rest of my life. So wherever I am, anywhere in the world, at any point, I'm always like this. I'm always looking around at the built environment. And not just looking at architecture, looking at people and how people move and how people interact. And I think without him even realising, he taught me that architecture isn't necessarily about buildings and that design isn't really about buildings. Um, if anything, for me, he taught me about kind of social science, you know, about how people live, how people react, how people interact, you know, how people might connect with their past through history, how they might speculate about their future. And in some ways, I think I'm probably more of a social scientist than I am an architect in some ways. Because it's much bigger, isn't it, about how we design things, how we think about the way something is crafted. Um, you know, even, I mean, Steve Jobs, one of his favorite quotes is, um, technology isn't enough. It isn't enough. For him, it was about art and social science. Um, and, and technology being pushed to do so much more to change that the way we live. So my granddad had a huge impact on me in terms of the kind of practical side of looking at life and buildings. My nan, I'd like to think my nan taught me about feature wallpaper. <laughs> Don't think she realised that you just had to do it on one wall for it to be a feature wall, and the rest would just be a blank canvas. But, joking aside, I didn't realise this, you know, until about two years ago, is that even though my nan was obviously very adventurous, going for very vivid over-the-top wallpaper on every different wall in the house. Someone said to me years later, they said, do you know why she did that? No. They said, because uh, she didn't have any money. I said, you, uh, you didn't even know my nan. What do you mean she didn't have any money? They said, because if you went to a wallpaper shop in the 1970s and the early 80s, you would have a basket or a bin in the corner with end of rolls, what we call end of rolls. So when there wasn't enough stock to wallpaper an entire room, they would just put the odd rolls back in that basket and you'd buy them for 10 pence each. So my nan had gone out and actively bought end of rolls and thought, right, I'm going to do that wall and that one, and I've only got enough to do that. And that taught me a lot when I found that out as well. It made me realise that so many things that we design and affect design are obviously affected by cost and affordability. But I still think it's really cool that my nana had the funkiest house, even though she bought the cheapest wallpaper that was available at the time. Um, so that image, as you can tell, kind of, it says a lot, a, a, a huge amount really about my life and my upbringing. Um, if, and just very quickly, because I could talk about my granddad all day, he, he got um, laid off in the building industry in the 1970s. And rather than just whinging about it, and after he got made redundant and being unemployed and claiming benefits, 
uh, he'd, he'd saved up a bit of money, he put some money away, and uh, he came into the house one day and he said, uh, I'm going to be a fisherman. Now, we all rolled around laughing because we'd never seen him fish. We'd seen him eat fish, but never fished before. He then got some um, naval architectural plans from a naval architect in Scotland. He'd gone to the bank and he'd borrowed a little bit of extra money because he hadn't quite saved up enough. He then went to college part-time on nights after he was doing labouring work to learn sheet metal working. And for the next three years, he built himself a fishing trawler. And that fishing trawler, seriously, for, that, for the next 20 years, he earned his living as a prawn fisherman, taking that fishing trawler out to the North Sea. Now, that's balls. I would not be able to build something to take out onto the North Sea. I'd be petrified. And he just did it. And he, he just taught me this kind of can-do attitude. You know, if something bad happens or something affects you, you know, don't sit back and whinge about it. Pick yourself up, dust yourself down, and do something about it. And I think he also taught me about a work ethic as well. The more you put in, the more you get out. It's as simple as that. And what you'll realise through my autobiographical chat, which I'm slightly embarrassed about, um, you'll just see that it's a sequence of events that just knock onto each other. There was no grand plan. There was no big master plan. I would just say yes to something that I thought was good, and then it would open another door and another door and another door and another door, and then you just think, oh, this is where I am today. So it's through that sequence of events and those opportunities that change your life. And I think, I genuinely believe that those life-changing moments only come about, and those opportunities only come about because you've grafted for them and you've worked for them. Obviously, you might get some by chance. Um, someone said, oh, you're really lucky. And there's a little bit, I thought, yeah, I am. But also, I think sometimes you make your own luck a lot of bit. If you put that effort and that work in, doors will open. I could do the whole lecture on this one image. <laughs> <coughs> There's me. Obviously, always interested in space. I wanted to be a spaceman before I became an architect. I thought space is just awesome. Um, but yeah, jo joking aside, it, it's, I was always thinking about innovation and technology. Uh, I was obsessed by NASA. Couldn't believe some of the stuff that NASA did. I used to read up about NASA all the time when I was younger. Um, and this is where I lived. This is where my mum still lives. Um, and I know we say home is where the heart is, but I really believe that. Um, and this house might not look like much, but it was a fantastic place to live. Um, my mum lives, as I say, at the end. Uh, my sister lives next door. Um, and they were built in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, all the way through to the mid-1970s. And I didn't quite realise that where I lived was so unique because uh, this is an image of Washington, not DC. Um, there's a Washington new town up in the northeast. The reason why Washington DC, by the way, this is our only claim to fame from my hometown. The reason why Washington DC is named that is obviously George Washington, but George Washington's ancestors are from here. So we get an invasion of American tourists turning up every summer, millions of coach lords to our new town up between, uh, it's between Sunderland and Newcastle. Um, and because of housing demand, uh, the Washington Development Corporation was formed and they decided to build a new town. So I had no idea that I was basically part of a social experiment. I had no idea whatsoever. I thought everyone just lived the way that we lived. Um, parts of it were a bit George Orwellian. I lived in District 3. It's not very kind of humane, that is it, really. But we never called them by district names. We called them by the old farm names that used to be there. So my estate was Blackfell, and the next one was Oxclaws. Um, and this is quite an early image, actually. This is a very early shop before anything was really built. That was District 1, which is the town centre, yeah, which was a shopping centre and car park. All of this has been built on and developed now. Uh, that was a saver centre, which is a kind of Sainsbury's. Uh, they built all of these road networks. Uh, that's the A1. So the A1 runs through there, and this road runs all the way through to Sunderland, and this one runs down to Newcastle. And the idea was, so this, is my, this was my village here. This is Blackfell, just on there on the right-hand side. And the idea was that it was like a radial town. So you had the town centre, and then you would have all the villages strung around it. And they genuinely got the best architects around at that time to design the housing stock, yeah, the best. Uh, they even got um, architects from abroad to come. 
and work on competitions to design the housing stock. Um, every single one of our villages had a little village centre, it had a pub, it had shops, it had schools. Um, and the quality of the design of those houses was fantastic. Really good quality, affordable homes. Uh, they were all designed around uh, courtyard squares, so we could all play and it was all very safe. Uh, cars were designed into the system, but weren't part of those public squares, so very few kids got knocked over on my estate. Now, I could walk from my house. My mum's house is exactly there. I could walk from my house up past those fields all the way up here to the top of the hill to my school and not cross a road. When I then had to go to comprehensive school, I could walk from my mum's house through all these pedestrianised squares, cross over the bridge, there was a main road there, main A road, cross over a bridge, go down through the underpass, carry on through Oxclose, all the way down to my comprehensive school there. And I never crossed a road. Fantastic urban design. Great master planning. Uh, it looks a little bit bare there, but after because this was, as I say, very early stages of the of the town being built. But after five or six years, the landscaping was unbelievable. You know, when, when everything grew, it was a beautiful green place to live. Um, not a single set of traffic lights. It actually won an award for that, which is hilarious. Uh, there was lots of roundabouts, um, but it all worked brilliantly. Um, and so, in effect, I lived in a town that was created in five years for eighty thousand people. Um, and it was still a building site, actually, when I, was, when I was growing up there. So I was kind of, you can kind of get the picture as to why I was, I was thinking about becoming an architect, surrounded by a building site. My granddad was a builder. My dad used to draw and sketch a lot. He was an amateur artist, so I used to sketch and draw with him. So I don't think I was ever going to be anything else. But it was a fantastic place to live. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. When you've experienced something like that, which is so positive, where people have come together and really collaborated, with a willingness and passion to build an innovative new town for 80,000 people, you wonder why we can't do this today. The government have made all sorts of announcements over the last few years about let's build some new towns, let's build green villages, and we haven't done any of it. And I can't quite get my head around that. We'll come on to that in a minute. So these are some of the architects' drawings, and these all got built, and I remember seeing these on the board saying this is what your village is going to look like, and uh, this is where you can shop, and really exciting stuff. And um, that's me in the square with my mates, that's me on a school day. And that little school that I showed you, the, my comprehensive school that I could walk to, when I got to uh, 14, I was in my CDT, DT class, you know, woodwork, metalwork, technology. And uh, Bob Radcliffe, this man was my, my teacher, and I said to Bob, I said, what do you want to do? I want to be an architect. I want to be an architect. Great, okay, yeah. Now, this guy literally changed my life because um, he'd mentioned, I think he was playing football for the school or something. The teachers had a football team. And they used to play lawyers and all sorts of people for different games um, on a night after the school had finished. And I think one night they were playing a team of architects. And Bob just pulled one of the guys aside and said, Look, we've got a lad who... It's really into architecture. Can you have a chat with them? He said, I'll send them up. So I went up after school one night, and then Bob managed to get me three days off school. I don't know how he wangled it, um, to go off to this architect's practice and just sit there and just absorb the practice for a few days. And it was brilliant. And at that point, I was hanging around architectural technicians, not really architects, but architectural technicians, the more technological side of, of building. And I decided I want to be a technician because um, none of my family had gone to university, so I never thought I'd ever be an architect. And this guy, seriously, was just a dream for me. This is a picture of me and him last year. We still keep in touch. And um, as I say, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for him. I went off to this other practice, and then in 1990, when I finished my GCSEs, Bob had put me forward for a job that had come up with David Johnson Architects. David Johnson was a one-man band architect. His wife was the secretary, and he had two technicians working for him. I'd finished my GCSEs, but I hadn't got the results in. And David said, well, I need someone, a trainee to come and work for me now, so you've got to make a decision. Do you want to come or do you not want to come? Do you want the job or not? And I said, well, and he said, it's obviously on condition that you get your four GCSEs. If not, you know, you can't stay. And uh, I was like, oh, I was like, should I do my A-levels? I just thought, oh, you know what? Sod it. I'll take the job. I'd much prefer to sit in an architect's practice than do my A-levels. I'm not saying you shouldn't do your A-levels. <laughs> um, and it was a mini-risk in some ways, because at that time, 
he said that he would send me off on a BTEC course to do a BTEC in building and construction. You couldn't go to university after just doing two years. You had to do four. You had to do a BTEC ordinary national certificate and a high national certificate. So in effect, I was taking a risk by <coughs> extending my educational period, if you like. But to be honest with you, the fact that I was going to be sitting in an architect's practice, I left school on the Friday, and I was in a job working for him, 40 quid a week. I was actually supposed to be YTS scheme. I was, he was supposed to be, I was supposed to get £27.50, but David found out he had to pay the Chamber of Commerce 40 quid, and they would pay me 20, £27.50. So he said, let's forget about the Chamber of Commerce. I'll just give you 40 quid if you want. And I said, fine. Um, and I went to work for him. And I'd, honestly, I left school, Oxford Close Comprehensive School on the Friday and started for him on the Monday. And it was a life-changing moment, really. Sitting, you know, we didn't have computers. We sat there with road ring pens and drawing boards. Um, I wasn't working on the most glamorous projects in the world. Uh, we were doing nursing homes. I think I worked on spa shops, quite a few spa shops in the northeast at the time. Um, saying that, I did get to work on Sunderland Stadium because I had to do some improvements for that. So I was really happy about that for my local club. Um, but the fact I was just around builders and around plasters and bricklayers and all that, it was just the buzz I got from it was fantastic, really. Um, and it really was the kind of foundation for the rest of my life. Those, those two years for a 16-year-old were, were staggering, really. Um, they then changed the rules to get to university. They made concessions that if you'd just had your BTEC ONC and you'd done quite well, you could get into university. So I went off to Newcastle to do my architectural uh, BA honours. And uh, I was scared stiff, petrified. I'd had all this kind of technical background, hanging out with my, and my BTEC in building construction. I was hanging out with hot carriers and plumbers and electricians and all. And then all of a sudden, I turned up at Newcastle University, where you had to have like two A's and two B's, A-levels to get in. And I hadn't done my A-levels, and I'd done this technical course. I was scared stiff. I remember the first week that I was there, they said, um, OK, we want to get you guys to explore space. Oh, come on, I can do that, I can do that. So, said, so there, if you can get some large sheets of paper out and put them on the wall, yeah, I can do that. And uh, here's some big, thick charcoal sticks for you. Fine. And then all of a sudden, they started getting like uh, croissants out and uh, peppers and stuff. And they chopped, I remember them chopping this croissant in half, and they said, do a cross-sectional drawing of that with charcoal. And I was like, oh my god, this is like an arts foundation course. I'm going to fail. It's going to take like two weeks. I'm going to be kicked out. So I drew the cross-section of a croissant for a week. I can still draw them beautifully today. I was so scarred by that process. And, uh, and it was, uh, it, it just, if you put it in some context, having such a technical upbringing, I was learning about damp-proof courses, dehumidifying systems of buildings, lumen levels of lights, uh, of the structural strength of timber, uh, death watch beetle, and how it can affect uh, timber frame buildings. And then I must have do a cross section of a croissant <coughs> with charcoal. And I thought I was going to fail, seriously. And I remember going home at Christmas thinking, oh my God, this is a nightmare. All my dreams are going to be shattered. And, um, and I just made a conscious decision. I thought, right, I'm going to put all that technical knowledge, all that stuff that I've learned, all that really, what I was trying to convince myself was boring, practical stuff to the back of my brain. And I've got to free myself up, otherwise I'm going to fail this course. So I did that. I just toured the croissant sketching party line for the rest of the year. And then in the second year, um, we had to do buildings. And uh, I had a fantastic tutor. He's still a very good friend. He's now head of uh, Westminster, architectural Westminster, a guy called Harry Charrington. And he was... It was a bit like my granddad. He was one of those guys who made me realize that architecture is much more than buildings and bricks and mortar, that it's actually about social science. You know, it's about way more than bricks and mortar. And uh, he got me to do buildings, but they were very different buildings in their approach. Um, he made me read novels and poetry, which my granddad would have gone mad about. Uh, I was asked to do drawings and images of space based on novels and books that I was reading at the time. And it freed me up quite a lot. And I was lucky enough to win the year prize for architecture that year. And I won it, the year prize for architecture in the third year. And if you did that, you automatically got the job to work for Faulkner Brown's architects up in the Northeast. They're a fantastic practice. I still work with them today. 
Um, and I got my first class degree and stuff like that. And it, I think it was, that was the first time in my life that I'd had a little bit of self-confidence that I could actually probably, possibly, maybe do this. Um, so I did front grants for you. That's me looking like a cheesy estate agent. Um, that was my first day on the job and I'd gotten the papers and all that sort of lark. And George, and that was, I was 21 in that picture. And um, it was amazing. So I'd gone from working on £100,000 projects, £150,000 projects with David Johnson to working on £8 million projects, £10 million projects um, with Fulton Browns. And uh, this was one of the first buildings I'd worked on back in uh, 1995 as Teesside University Library, £10 million project. And um, it's still there today, going strong, which is good. Um, and this is, why, this is why I keep saying about this kind of sequence of events, that doors can open, things can happen. Because um, I met a girl... And she lived in London. And I was going to go back to Newcastle University. And she went, no, I'll come to London for the summer. So I got a summer job working for Sir Terry Farrell. I don't know if you know Terry Farrell's work. He designed Charing Cross Station and uh, the MI6 headquarters. And uh, big master planner, one of the kind of superstars of British architecture. So I worked for Terry for like three months. And then Terry said to me, don't go back to university. Why don't you just stay for a bit longer? You know, take a bit more time out. So I carried on working for Terry. And I did uh, another nine months working for him. And then he said to him, we've just won some competitions in Hong Kong. Do you fancy going to work in the Hong Kong office? And I've only just, I just realized that today when I was looking at my diary, it's nearly 20 years to the day. It was the 1st of May, 1997, that Terry put me on a flight. It was the day that Labour won the election when Tony Blair got in. And uh, I jumped on a flight and got sent off to Hong Kong as a 22-year-old at that point to work on these major projects. And it was, uh, there's Terry. Um, his practice is just off the Edgware Road in northwest London. He's, he's 82 and still practicing and going strong. He's got a really fantastic business. Hong Kong office is still flying as well. It's doing really well. And Terry was like, oh, could you uh, just... They called me the fat pen boy in the office, right? Not because I was fat. It was because I used to do all the competition drawings with a big fat pen. And Terry was like, oh, could you work on this airport building? And, and five years later, it was built. You know, £350 million building all done and built and finished and... Uh, he designed the peak, I wasn't involved in that, but when I turned up in Hong Kong, he said, oh, we need to design six railway stations in six months to link Hong Kong with China. Um, they're about half a billion pounds each, and do you think we can do it? And we've got to design the railway station box, um, hundreds of thousands of square feet of retail space, and then a mini town on top, um, where people can we get about six or 7,000 people living in tower blocks on top. Do you think we can do that? So he pulled all these teams together, and I sat working on those designing these massive infrastructure projects. And it was, it was frightening, really, because you're making these marks on paper, thinking this isn't just conceptual stuff. This is going to get built. <coughs> you know, this is actually going to happen. Every move that you made with a pen stroke became built reality um, and then became homes and places where people lived. This is Kowloon Station, which is all built and all done one of the biggest rail stations interchanges in the world. And we worked on skyscrapers there and all sorts of weird and wonderful buildings. I then had to go back to school, basically, because I wasn't qualified. And uh, I came back to London and went to University College London in 1997, which was fantastic. Um, I don't know if you know the Bartlett School of Architecture, if you've heard of the Bartlett. It's a kind of wonderful, wonderful school of architecture, very experimental. Um, and by then, I'd built up a bit of confidence. And after Newcastle, even Newcastle was a slightly practical architectural school, and, and the Bartlett wasn't. It was very off the wall. So I just had a great time for two years. Brilliant time. It was great being in London. Real buzz about the place. I finished in 99. And I went back to Farrell's. And legally, I was supposed to stay at Terry Farrell's for a year before I could, be, I could do my part three exams and become an architect. Um, but I started to get off at work. Tiny jobs. Uh, my first ever job was 20 minutes walk from here. Someone had £30,000 to convert their apartment, and it was my first ever project. And uh, I set up a practice in 2000. Literally the 1st of January, it was New Year's Day 2000, uh, set up the practice. And me and a friend of mine, Bobby Desai, uh, it was just me and him for two years without, without any staff whatsoever building the practice up. And that's when we started getting into more domestic architecture. Um, 
you know, swimming pools, small, small swimming pools for private clients, doing the houses. And the, the office was just all built around homes. Uh, we won a competition to design three houses down in Petersham. You might, I don't know if you've ever come across these. They've been published quite a lot uh, just by the river down near Petersham Nurseries. Um, we did three houses there for a big developer at the time. So these are our drawings for that. Then I started doing my own house, doing that up. And so most of our work tended to be, um, began to be conversion projects or refurbishments of old buildings. And I've always had a love for old buildings anyway. I love the fact that they've all got a, a story, they've all got a history, they've all got a past. I love a kind of who do you think you are of homes, you know, about who's lived there and why they were built and what purpose they had. And that followed through really to be kind of restoration man. And we did galleries in East London. Then I formed George Clark and Partners years later. And then TV came along. Literally, I stumbled into it. Um, everyone thinks I must have done media studies, uh, drama, um, that I must have had an ambition to be on television, and I must have gone for screen tests and casting. And uh, I've never really told this story before, so I'll tell it for the first time. Um, I was teaching architecture part-time at Newcastle University. Newcastle University said, you need to do research as well as teach. I went, okay. So you, I'm trying to run my practice in London four days a week, come up here every Friday to teach the students for a day. And I loved being directly involved with the students, so I used to do like 12-hour teaching days. And I was like, I, just, I don't think I'm going to have time. And they went, write a book. Just write a book. And if you get a book published, we can put that in for some research funding, and you've ticked that box. So I went to see a friend of mine who was a writer, and I went, I've been asked to write a book. She went, just write a couple of proposals of things that you're passionate about and um, let's see how we get on. And I'd written some things up and then she said, look, why don't you go and see a literary agent in Covent Garden? Uh, she's a friend of mine. She can probably help you out, you know, give you a little bit of advice. I went in to see her. Uh, it was a little bit embarrassing because my ideas were a bit rubbish, I think. And, uh, and she just said, look, you seem really passionate about what you do. And because you're so passionate, why don't you just sign for us? I was like, a literary agent, you want me to sign for a literary agency? Yeah, just sign for us and then we'll work with you over the next few months and we'll just see how things go. So this was 10 o'clock on the Thursday morning in 2003 sometime. So I signed, 2004. So I signed. And on the Monday morning she called me up and she said, um, how do you fancy doing television? And I thought it was a joke. And I went, nah, not interested. Because I genuinely wasn't interested. Uh, I think... I think Grand Designs was probably the only architectural program or property program that I would watch. That started in 2000 with Kevin. Um, and so this was 2003, 2004. And I was like, nah, just, everything else was like rubbish on television. And I said no. And then she did that mum thing, you know, when she like calls you back the next day and says, well, you know, you've got nothing to lose, you know. Why don't you give it a try? And you might not like it, and they might not like you. And da, da, da. I was like, honestly, Rosemary, I do not want to do television. Called me again on the Wednesday. She said, they're hassling me all the time. They really want to meet you because they've been casting for architects or designers, and they haven't found anyone they like. Um, so I've booked it in tomorrow morning for you at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I went in. It was awful. It was like your cliched... TV executive meeting, so um, just like those guys who've got a camera at the back, there was someone standing there with a camera over the shoulder of this executive, TV exec, and he's sitting at his desk, and then they put me in a chair roughly where you are, and the chair was like three foot lower than his chair, so I felt really tiny sitting there. Um, and he was like, oh, so tell us about you, and um, that, that didn't really work with me, hence, hence why this is the first time I've given an autobiographical talk. And I was like, I'm not going to talk about myself. And he just, he just said, well, look, why don't you tell us about your passion for architecture? And that was it. I didn't shut up for half an hour. And at 5 o'clock that afternoon, got the phone call saying to my agent, you've got the job. And I said, I'm not doing it. <laughs> that was one of the most awful experiences of my whole life. I'm not doing it. And uh, she persuaded me to go and do it. And I did the first day's film. So to this day, I have never had a day's media training. Uh, I didn't really do drama at school because I didn't really like it. Um, I've never been to TV presenting school or anything like that. Um, it was just another form of apprenticeship for me. I just learned on the job and just did it. Um, and it's dead easy. If I can do it, anybody can do it. 
Um, so building your life in the country was one of the first series that I made, people moving from city life to country life and doing the properties at the same time. And uh, from water towers to all sorts of buildings. And then eventually I got to write the book because after the of the series, they said, oh, you might get a little book deal. So I wrote my first ever book, Building Your Life. And, uh, and that was lovely, actually. I really enjoyed it. It was a lovely process of writing properly for the first time away from university studies and thesis. Then I had an idea called The Home Show, a uh, very simple idea, um, which was to go into people's ordinary houses and make them lovely. Simple as that, you know. And it was all based on spaces that didn't work. So obviously houses were built for a very different time. That house might have been there for 70, 80 years. Uh, does that space work for you? Now, the interesting part about it was this is when I'm really... I was always worried that TV might be a bit shallow and it might be a bit selling out and, you know, are we really going to get under the skin of architecture and homes? And will the, will the medium of television allow me to do that? And I made a decision that if it didn't allow me to do that, I'd pack it in and go back to the day job. I still had the practice anyway, but they were still going on. And um, it was a big decision for me as to whether to keep doing television. Could I explore some of the things I was passionate and interested in through that medium? And it made me realise, actually, that on the home show, and I don't mean this the wrong way, but all the people that we would film would regard themselves as being quite ordinary people. Just very straightforward, ordinary you know, good, lovely people. Wouldn't see themselves as being extraordinary in any way. They certainly weren't wealthy at all. Uh, we had a range of budgets from £30,000 to about £80,000 to refurb their house, which is nothing. You know, you can't even compare that to grand designs where they're spending six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand pounds 900000 And I realised that that money meant a massive amount to them. And I also realised that their home meant even more to them. And so I had to get it right. So I came up with this idea that I'd go and live with them for 24 hours. And I thought, if, I was, if I'm going to redesign a three-bedroom semi-detached house in northwest London, I'm bound to design that house differently depending on the family that lives there. That might sound really obvious, but it means you've really got to get under the skin of those people. You've really got to understand them in terms of their style, their taste, what kitchen they like, what wallpaper they might like, what flooring they might like, but also how they live. You know, do they work from home? Do they not work from home? Have they got kids? Have they not got kids? You know, that completely changes the dynamic of what this piece of architecture we call home does for you. And for me, it's the most important piece of architecture in your life. It's certainly the most expensive thing you're ever going to buy, unless you're rich enough to buy a yacht or a Bugatti Veyron or something like that. Um, you're probably going to take on a lot of debt to buy the house as well. But it actually crafts who you are. It's like, for me, your home's like an extended member of your family. Crafts who your family are. Crafts how you come together. It forms all sorts of memories, doesn't it? It's a powerful piece of architecture when you think about it. You know, even my mum's house, which is very, very straightforward, early 1970s house. I could tell you exactly how that house works. I could walk around that house blindfolded, and I wouldn't bump into anything. I could even tell you which floorboard squeaks going down the stairs, because I had to step over it on Christmas morning, so I didn't wake my mum and dad up when I snuck down to see what the presents I had down there. You know, you could literally walk down and you go, right, that one creaks and I'm not going to touch that door like that. You know, you're constantly mapping the places and the environments that you live in. So for me, the home show was actually quite groundbreaking. And, and the process of, you know, I love to draw. I'm just obsessed by drawing. I draw, sometimes I can't even, it's surprising that I'm talking so much and not drawing because I'm normally chatting and drawing at the same time. Uh, I love drawing by hand. Um, unfortunately, I'm of an age where I've given up drawing on the computer. Um, and I just love sketching. And I'll say to kids, even today, when kids come up to me and say, I want to be an architect, I'll say, right, OK, get your mum and dad to go and buy you a little sketchbook, carry it in your pocket with you every single day, and promise me that you do one drawing a day. Right? And these are like eight-year-old kids going, OK. And I'm like, just do one drawing a day. I don't care what it is. It could be a flower, it could be a bus, it could be that, it could be a bottle of water. But just do one drawing for me every single day. It could just take you five minutes. It might take you five hours. It doesn't matter. Just do one drawing a day. Because if you do that, it makes you see things. It makes you really understand things, really get to grips with it. You know? So drawing for me is just such a beautiful medium. And as I say, it allows me to think, allows me to test, and allows me to push ideas. And so we would just take these ordinary houses and knock a couple of walls down here and there, a few shifts here and there, and... You know, the, the, these aren't like amazing radical pieces of 
design because we didn't have the budget sometimes to do it. But it was about creating a place called home. Very special place called home. Really understanding how people live, how spaces work, how spaces don't work sometimes. And off the bat of that, I'll write another book. Um, uh, George Clark's Home Bible. If you come across this book, every single drawing, every single word in that book I did. Um, for three weeks I sat in a dark room and did every drawing to talk about how you can take existing buildings and change them. And it's, I'm still proud of it today, actually. It's a 400-page beast about getting under the skin of home and what it means. And then Restoration Man came along. And I, it, I love it. I'm going to show a little film at the end, so I'm not going to talk about this too much. Uh, Restoration Man's just ended. Um, I made a tough decision last year that it was going to be my last series. It was my choice. Um, the reason why I did that is I think all good things need to come to an end. Um, and I've got some great opportunities to make some other things, so I had to free up some time. But Restoration Man was lovely. It's all about taking buildings that were never intended to be lived in. Yeah, industrial, military, agricultural buildings, some of them tiny, some of them massive. We had World War II military bunkers. Uh, this is a castle in Ireland. We had a 1950s air control tower. We had an old Victorian ice house. Uh, all of them with magnificent stories. And you just think, God, the people who built these buildings, th this, is the, this is the bunker, staggering, 80,000 square foot bunker that the guy bought for 30 grand. Can you believe it? Incredible building, really. This is one of my favourites, which is Thrum Mill in Northumberland. Uh, look, I keep saying ordinary people, but they're not ordinary people. They're actually quite extraordinary. But um, Dave and Margaret, who bought this house, had a four-bedroom, semi-detached house in Whitley Bay. And then all of a sudden take on a 250-year-old mill, derelict abandoned building for years, and did all the work themselves. They'd never done anything like this ever before. The blood, sweat, and tears they'd put into it. I won't talk about it too much because it's in the film at the end. And I love the, th I love the thought that when someone built this 1930s Art Deco-style reinforced concrete water tower, that they would think, they would never imagine in their wildest dreams that anyone would be daft enough to turn it into a house. You know, they just wouldn't, would they? You've built this utilitarian, functional building to store 20,000 gallons of water at the top to provide safe, clean drinking water to the local village. And then years later, that's me in the tank, um, years later, actually, I've been, I haven't put the finished shot in of this. Years later, it's a, it's a lovely, finished, five-bedroom house, you know. And then I got a bit political with the Great British Property Scandal. I got on the train and went back to my mum's. And the train, when it goes up to Newcastle, cuts through Gateshead. And as I went through Gateshead, I was seeing people being moved out of their Victorian terraced houses. And then I was seeing uh, bulldozers coming in and knocking them down. Now, I lived in, uh, they're called um, Tyneside Flats. So a lot of them are split into um, ground floor flat and first floor flat. I lived in something identical to that in Newcastle when I was a student. And it's a great place to live, so I couldn't really understand it. It was all part of uh, John Prescott's Housing Market Renewal Programme. Um, and he would actively give councils money to demolish their old housing stock to build new houses. It's one of the stupidest things I've ever come across in my life. Yeah. Yes, if you've got old housing stock, that needs to be improved. Of course it does. But when there's such a massive demand for new homes, why can't we restore this stuff and bring it into the 21st century and build some new stuff as well? It seemed mad to me that the council would actively give people between 30 and 50,000 pounds to move them out of their houses, to then demolish the houses, and then get a developer to come in and build new ones. So it was actually like a mild form of social cleansing, really. Let's get that lot out, demolish all of that, and let's build some new ones, and let's get some trendy people living in the area, and that'll make the world a better place. Well, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? It's mad, absolutely mad. Um, so we had, at the time, 260,000 empty homes across Britain. Now, I couldn't get my head around that when there's so much housing demand. When my sister, who I've bought the house next door to my mum, uh, to get her on the property ladder, she would have given anything to have one of these flats, and she's only a few miles down the road. So for me, it was like a research project. It was like a line of inquiry. Why are all these houses empty? So I, I made um, three one-hour programs called the Great British Property Scandal to get under the skin of empty homes and why they exist. And the repercussions of that were just fantastic. We had an empty home spotter app where people were going around taking pictures of empty properties in their area. Because actually, in fairness to some local councils, they didn't realise how many empties they had. Some properties were empty, but people were paying council tax on them still. 
So, which is mad when you think about it. So it wasn't coming up as an empty home on the council system. So we, with this app, and we won loads of awards for this digital app because it literally changed the housing market in some parts of Britain. One guy in Essex went round. So if you took a picture of an empty home, you could put the address in there in the app and press send, and it would be sent to our database and sent to the council to make the council aware that there was empties in their area. One guy in Essex reported 725 empty homes. <laughs> he went round and just photographed all of them. That's brilliant. That's how passionate people were about it, because what was happening? If you had empty homes in your area, it was starting to drag the area down, because people would vandalise them, smash the windows up, you know, rip off all the guttering and the lead and stuff like that. Actually, that's quite funny about this image. On this image, uh, it's not funny at all, actually, but it wound me up. Uh, so, um, uh, when the council started moving everybody out, there was still a couple of residents in here. And, um, but these residents, in effect, were forced to move out because the council had actively sent round contractors to take off all the lead flashings and all the, the metalwork guttering and downpipes to stop other people nicking it and vandalising the houses. So obviously that was sold off as scrap by the council and they would have made some good money out of it. What that meant, because it's a terrace, is that once you've taken the flashings and the guttering off that party wall, water starts to get in, then it seeps through the party wall, so it's damp. Horrendous levels of damp, actually, on the side of the wall where someone's still living there. And it got to the stage where they hated living there so much they just stopped fighting it through the tower line and took their compulsory purchase money and left. It's terrible, isn't it? It's an awful way of doing things, really. And then off the back of that, we set up a um, training program for young people under the Empty Homes campaign, and I worked with London Youth. And these were quite disillusioned, uh, angry kids in London. And I'm talking, like, in gangs. This lad had been stabbed, like, three months before I got him on the program. And, um, and I had this simple idea. I thought, hang on, we've got all these young people that when I talk to them, they get really angry. Oh, oh people don't understand us, you know. They think we're just stupid, you know, and that we don't care, but we do care, da 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 And then I'd go on, and I thought, we've got all these retired builders or semi-retired builders with all this knowledge with time on their hands. Why don't I get these retired builders together with these kids, and let's see what happens. So let's see if they'll pass that knowledge on to them and inspire them. So I put an ad in a paper in Brixton to invite any retired builders to come to a calf, and I'd buy them a fry-up if they came along and they might be interested in being part of this campaign. Loads of them turned up, it's brilliant. Bought them the fry up, and we filmed them. And when I filmed them, they would sit there and go, ah, young people just don't understand us today. You know, they don't care about us. There's no respect anymore, da, 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 da. And they were saying nearly exactly the same things that the kids were saying. So I put them together, put them on empty homes. We got 11 empty homes off Lambeth Council, and we put them on site. And it was the most magical thing I've ever seen. It was fantastic. Because what you had, it, it had its problems, don't get me wrong. There was one or two people walked off. You know, some, of the, some kids had some serious issues and couldn't handle it and walked off. And I tried to help them in other means. But what happened was you realised that it was all about people. Because after about two weeks, each one of these kids would become really close to one of those mentors on site. Really close. I mean to the point where they were having to laugh, they'd go to the pub after they'd finished work, and all that. And what it made me realise is actually all these kids didn't have any role models. Um, a lot of them had parents who were in serious trouble, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, gang abuse, crime, maybe the dad was in prison, and maybe the mum was in prison. And they didn't have anyone who cared about them at all. And all of a sudden, the building process, it actually wasn't about building at the end of the day. This is why I keep talking about social science. The empty home and the building project just became a means of bringing these people together and them doing something. It was great at the same time. We got an empty home back into use and we housed someone and put a roof over their head. It was fantastic. But the, you can't hide in the building game. You know, it's quite a linear process. So you, you've got to get stuck in. If you don't pull your weight, someone has a go at you. And all of a sudden, it bonded these very, very strong relationships. It's one of the greatest things that I've ever done. The outcomes were absolutely incredible. I'm going to have to be quick, because we'll never get any questions in. Then Amazing Spaces came along, and we got into caravans and camper vans and tree houses and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And so I decided to take on my own caravan project. So I bought a 1979 Ace Excellence caravan, because this was 
This was exactly the same, identical to all the caravans that I had for my holidays growing up in the northeast. We'd drive about an hour down to Red Car in Thursk. We'd stay in a 30 foot by nine foot caravan. I could walk around that blindfolded and tell you exactly what the layout was like, you know. Um, and I love the fact, I love Britain. I love the fact that we put Tudor leaded windows on a 1979 <laughs> caravan. It's amazing, eh? And, um, and I did it up and uh, reconfigured the space, we insulated it, we strengthened the frame, we, you know, we did all sorts to kind of drag it, at, kicking and screaming really into the, into the 21st century. Um, it sits by Coniston Water in the Lake District. I still own it today, I will never sell it. It might fall apart, because um, it's, you know, it's all that's getting on. So I've got, to keep, I've got to keep restoring it and doing work to it. And I love the fact that on the outside it looks like every other static caravan. It's part of a kind of national trust site really it's a farm really so it's not there's not that many caravans there to be honest um so i had to paint it in the national trust approved colors otherwise i would have got in massive trouble <laughs> but then i just love the fact that when i turn up it goes it starts to look like this <laughs> and uh, the side drops down and the doors open up and the kids have got a little trap door to escape there and we've made the bedrooms more efficient and it's it's just brilliant i mean my kids prefer staying in this than any hotel that i take them to on holiday it, it really is it's a magical thing and that opened my eyes up to the tiny house movement and the fact that um, people are trying, because of the affordability crisis that we've got, uh, I mean, you know, young people trying to get on the property ladder today, just being, but not even young people, you know, the average age of a first time buyer now is in their kind of mid thirties. They reckon that's gonna rise to 42 years old by 2025. Can you imagine that being your first time buyer at 42 years old? That's just mad. Um, and so, even though this might be a bit fun and was a bit quirky, started to raise questions about small-scale living, because obviously if we can build smaller and live smaller, it's going to cost less. Simple as that. Hence why amazing spaces are now going to all sorts. So this is another treehouse we did. Uh, garden studio builds we've done. I did this at home. Uh, my kids have got a butterfly house and all sorts of stuff. And it's all lovely, basically. Now, I've dropped this in. This is the... The most recent one we did for Amazing Spaces. It's just been at Ideal Home Show um, down at Olympia. Uh, it's going to be at Ideal Home Show Scotland in May and then in Manchester in June. Um, I came up with a mad idea because I'm always trying to push prototypes and new ways of thinking about space. And this is a rotating house. So I said to the guys, let's do a rotating house. And I'm like, oh, great. So it's going to rotate like this and we'll get 360 degree views of wherever we put it. I went, no, 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 I want it to rotate vertically, not horizontally. And they all looked at me as if I was stupid, which was fair enough. Um, they said, why do you want to do that? I said, well, if you think about it, if you live by yourself, if you're a, a sole occupier of a house and you've got a flat or a house or whatever, you can't be in more, room, more than one room at the same time. You can't be in bed while you're having a bath and you can't be in the kitchen while you're sitting in the living room watching the telly. You can only ever be in one room at the same time. So can we design a house that when each time it rotates, it becomes a new room? Yeah. And so we've, we've designed it in a circular drum, which allows it to rotate. We've used some very basic technology to turn it around. We took the motor off some wheelchairs. Uh, the wheelchair motor is really cool. It's got a lot of torque to it, so it can turn things really quickly. It's got a bit of energy to it. So you've got little wheelchair motors here, little wheels, and the house rotates. And obviously it rotates four times for four rooms. Someone's got a better shot. Yeah. <coughs> so this is in kitchen dining room mode. Yep. I should have put more images for this actually because it's really cool. Um, in that mode, you're sitting there at your dining table and having lovely food and there's your kitchen. And... We've put the microwave and all the kit in the kitchen on gimbals that you get in bolts. So as the house rotates, all of those things stay level yeah, all the time. It was easy with cutlery because you just use magnets to keep it all in place. And when you're sitting in your dining table, you can see the silver surface of the TV. So when that rotates 90 degrees, this black panel will be on the wall and you can see what looks like a little seating alcove is actually the lounge. Yep. So the lounge will be here. I'll put another shot in. No, I haven't actually. The lounge will be here. Your TV will be on the wall. Your kitchen then goes on the ceiling. Yep. Then it turns again 90 degrees. This black panel is then on the ceiling. Yep. 
And as you've pushed a button to lift this up to become your dining table when it's in that position, on the underside of that panel is a mattress. So when it's on the ceiling and it drops down, that becomes your mezzanine bed. Yeah? So you've got a bed in the ceiling above you at the top. The panel that's on the ceiling now, actually, so if you imagine that flipped 180 degrees, that little slot that's in the ceiling is my wardrobe. So that when your bedroom's mezzanine bed is up at the top level, I've got a wardrobe at the bottom, and we've vac-packed all of my clothes, my books of shorts and everything, and compressed them as tightly as possible. We put them on one of those kind of Athena poster racks. So basically, when I want to select my boxer shorts and my socks, you just go through like an Athena poster and pick out what you want from the vac pack and put them on. And so it was all mad. It was all completely off the wall. But you do get dining, kitchen, wardrobe space, living area, all in the same 3x3x3 three by three by three meter cube. You're probably wondering where the toilet is. You've obviously got to be able to step out of the space when it rotates because you don't want to turn at the same time. You'd need a Velcro suit or something like that, so it's not very practical. So can you see this little area here at the back? You step up onto that area, because remember, it's a cube inside the drum. So there's an area at the back, two square meters, where you stand. And can you see the little buttons, those little buttons? They're the four modes for you to press to turn it. So you stand there while the house rotates. On the left-hand side, there's a shower. And on the right-hand side, there's a toilet, because you don't want your toilet to rotate. It could, get, <laughs> it could get incredibly messy. Now, you might go, that's all bonkers. That's all completely mad. But that means you've got 36 square meters of usable space and a footprint of nine square meters. With the two square meters that you've got at the back with the toilet and the shower, you've actually got 38 square meters, yeah? So you've got four rooms in the same volume as one. Now, I'm not saying you would all want to live in that, but it's pushing the boundaries of space. It's literally turning space on its head. And it's opening up all sorts of possibilities. And that's what I think needs to happen in the housing market. Because all we're really doing now is designing, got to be careful, dumb boxes. You know, there is a room, and you put a bed in it. Then you go into that room, and there's a kitchen. Then you go into that room, and there's a bath. We're not thinking about multifunctional furniture. We're not thinking about intelligent surfaces. You know, we're not getting into any of that stuff. We're, not, we're, we're designing pieces of furniture now that can do four or five different things. Not just one where you're going to sit and eat. We force the design of all of our products to do four or five different things if we can. In a very simple way. It's not some complicated gymnastics. Some of it's super simple. We developed, um, one of the first ones we did was called Click Furniture. Click Furniture is like, um, it's like flat pack on a wall. So I would have, you could have a panel of plywood or MDF as your backboard, and then you would have another panel in front. And we'd CNC cut uh, the legs of a chair and the top of a chair, and it's sitting on magnets. Yeah? And all you do is you pop off the top, and you pop off the legs, and you cross the legs over the top of each other, and you put the top on it, and you sit on it, and you use your chair. And you can put, so in a house like this, you can put six of those chairs there, but you don't want six chairs sitting in the space all the time if you live there by yourself and you've just got friends around for dinner once on a Thursday night. So you pop the top off and you pop the legs off and you put them back on the wall again. It's like taking IKEA furniture, making it in 10 seconds, and then putting it back flat pack again afterwards when you don't need to use it anymore. Super cheap. So cheap. Bit of CNC cutting and a few magnets. That's it. <coughs> Excuse me. And I make shed of the year and we'll get on all sorts of lovely sheds, another book. Um, and then when I see you stumble at things, I've now got a TV production company called Amazing Productions. So we're making all sorts of property TV formats and all sorts of other films, as well as panoramas and dispatches and things I never thought I'd ever get involved in in my life. And I now make a series called Ugly House to Lovely House, where the, as that image shows on the top, we take a really ugly house and we make it lovely. It's Ron Seal. It does what it says on the tin, basically. Um, uh, and this is the serious point I've been trying to kind of hint at a little bit through the whole thing. We've got a massive housing and affordability crisis. Housing demand is way beyond the current level of supply. Um, the government have set another target, which we're never going to meet, of building 300,000 houses a year. So we're going to build 3 million houses over the next 10 years. Well, to be honest, over the last 25 years, we haven't even really built more than about 2 million. Um, so we're never going to do it. And for me, uh, building isn't a numbers game. It is for politicians. It's not for me. It's not about how many we build. It's about what we build. 
you know, where we build it, what's it made out of, what does it do for humanity, what does it do for the built environment. Um, I think one of the reasons why we've got a lot of nimbyism in this country is because a lot of the stuff that we build is rubbish, to be honest. A lot of people object to seeing houses built in their backyard because they're not very good and they're not very affordable and their kids can't afford to be in them. You know? So what is it really con contributing um, to humanity and, and to communities by being able to do that? I think if you said to someone, we would like to build 100 houses you know, just on the edge of your village and they're going to be designed by a really good talent at architectural practice. They're going to be highly sustainable. They're going to be very beautifully designed. Um, obviously, we've got to juggle that with affordability. But if we innovate in the industry a lot more, we might be able to make our houses more affordable through innovation. Um, you know, and it's going to be a lovely place to live. Would you object to that? Most people would go, that sounds great. That sounds fantastic. But when a big house builder comes in and builds naughty boxes, lots of them, just churns them out. You know, without any really clever master planning or intelligent ideas about green design, people just see them making big profits and get really angry about it. And that's why nimbyism really exists. And now, as much as I loved hanging out with plasters and bricklayers, this is still the way we're building houses today. Why are we using so many wet trades? I don't get it. You know, we lay bricks in the rain. You know, if it falls be below two degrees in the winter, we can't lay bricks. You know, we just can't do it, you know, because the, the cement doesn't go off properly. So, you know, Bill and Freddie are like, right, I'm going home, we'll be back tomorrow. You know, come back, lay a few more bricks. There's been a brick shortage the last two years, so we can't even build enough houses because we haven't got enough bricks. And it's just mad, you know. And then it takes us ages to get the roof on, you know. And then we've got to get the plasterers in after it's been first fix electrics, and then we've got to wait for the plaster to dry before anyone can decorate it. Why are we using so many wet trades? I think it's mad. If you think about it, the building regulations has made us improve insulation standards, uh, double glazing, it hasn't gone far enough, but it's made us do all of these things since the 1970s. But if you take away those insulation standards and the double glazing we've put in, and those relatively minor elements, important, but minor, we're still building houses like the Romans did. We are. The Romans would dig a trench, put cement and concrete in there, yeah, then they'd get bricks and blocks and stone and they'd build it up and they'd put a timber roof on. Then they'd tile it with clay tiles. Then they'd put timber windows in. How is that any different <laughs> to some of the standard housing that we're building today? It just isn't. Which is why it's been hinted at. I, I won't get into architecture. But I was going to be a bit snobby, actually. And they all look the same, don't they? It doesn't matter where it is. They all look the same now. You know, this is me being an architectural snob, but they really do. And, you know, if you went to Jonathan Ive at Apple or Dyson or, or Conran to design a housing estate, it wouldn't look like that, would it? You just know it wouldn't. You know with the way that they think, they wouldn't design houses like that. So why are we doing it? It's mad. And Ian Callum was mentioned in the intro. He's a very good friend of mine, Ian Callum. Ian's the head of design at Jaguar Land Rover, and uh, he designed the Aston Martin DB9, and... Things like that. Me and, me and Ian have big debates about house building. And, uh, you know, the car industry is amazing. You know, they'll invest half a billion pounds in the development of a new car for it to come out. You know, it's built by technologists and engineers. It's clean tech. It's built in controlled conditions. You know, it's been approved and quality checked. So, you know, even if you buy a really cheap car, you know it's taken some very good quality minimum standards. You know what I mean? It's been, it's safe. You know, you wouldn't build a brand new, you wouldn't set up a car company and say, right, let's build them all in that field outside and let's plaster the inside of it and render the outside. You just wouldn't, would you? It's like, what? A stupid idea. So why, don't we, why can't we build homes in, in factories? Now, um, I'm not supposed to be telling you about this. I'm really not. I'm going to get in massive trouble, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, on May the 10th, I'm launching MOBI, which is the Ministry of Building Innovation, and it's the home of advanced construction thinking and precision build homes. It's been years in planning, years in the making. We're doing a master's course in advanced home futures. We're doing B-Tech courses in advanced building and construction. Uh, we are going to Jaguar Land Rover. We're going to go to all sorts of great innovators and great manufacturers to push the boundaries of home design and home thinking. There's no home courses out there. You can do an architecture course, you can do an interior design course, you can do all that sort of stuff, but no one ever talks about home. I did eight years of high-end architectural education and I never once designed a house. 
We did skyscrapers, we did all sorts of flagship stuff, but we never did anything about home, ever. Um, so we've set up the first courses to do that. We're going to do social outreach programs with schools and communities to try and get young people passionate about homes and building. We're going to harness Minecraft and Lego, uh, anything, to, to harness that passion that young kids have got for drawing and designing and building to make a difference. Now, I didn't tell you about that, obviously. And so for me, this is the house building industry now, which is very Flintstones. And Moby, the Ministry of Building Innovation, is going to be very Jetsons. Uh, this isn't one of our houses, because I'm not allowed to show you the ones that we've done. Uh, been, the first one's been launched on May the 4th. I thought of Star Wars, you know. May the 4th be with you and all that. Um, uh, but innovative homes should be accessible, flexible, expandable, mobile, sustainable. You know, they should be affordable. They should be beautiful. I didn't design this. This is not one of ours. I've just put this in as a kind of futuristic house image. You might not even like it. Um, it's just about the way it's built for me. It's about that process of getting better quality homes for a more affordable price rather than building in this antiquated way that we've been building for years and years. So who knows what the next chapter of the story is? That's a... That's a I've spoken for too long, nearly an hour. Thanks, George. That was uh, just a really good, uh, a really just riveting talk, and I took lots of notes, and I know we've got lots of questions here, and some people have already um, handed me them. I should have said at the beginning, my name's Andy Mitchell from the D&T Association. Sorry, it was a bit of a rush at the beginning to get here. I should have introduced myself. Um, I'm going to start, though, George. I, mean, I was really interested about the numbers and the numbers of houses that we need, and I know how passionate you are about that. And I know that today, um, both of the big parties, Tories and Labour, have been arguing about how many houses they've built and uh, trying to uh, go for it. I'm just wondering, you know, we had Theresa May saying today, I think, that um, they've built more council houses. Labour are saying that if they get into power, they will build a million houses, a million houses in five Still years. What? Anyone what? can throw numbers around. Exactly. What? How are they, how are they going to do that? My question to you is, okay, maybe that's answered it, but my question to you is, what would your question, or what would your advice perhaps be to the party that gets in? <laughs> well, the, the government published a white paper in January. Uh, if you've got time, it, it genuinely is, if you're passionate about homes and housing, it, it is worth looking at. Uh, it's a consultation paper. Um, so if you just go on, if you just put in a housing white paper, uh, January 2017, it'll pop up and you can download it as a PDF. And in fairness, it is the first time that any government in my lifetime has acknowledged that the housing market is broken, that the system actually doesn't work. Now, just for that to be acknowledged is quite a big mm. step, mm. a big, big step. And when you read that report, there's actually some recommendations and thoughts about how we could change things, and they're actually pretty good. Mm. Um, I was asked if I would contribute on a certain part, and I took a page 53, because I did a bit on that. Um, and what I, what I pushed for uh, was innovation. Because, uh, and this is statistically proven, that if you look at the aerospace industry, the car industry, technology industries, telecommunication industries, the level of innovation that's happening, percentage year on year through their R&D, is staggering. Sometimes it's like between 30 and 45% increased levels of productivity and innovation happening within their companies. In the UK house building industry, it's 11% maximum. Mm -hmm. right? Now, that to me is proving that because we're not innovating, we're not building better quality products. <coughs> if you innovate, I call it the Betamax video effect, right? If my dad bought a Betamax video in like 1982, and it was like 350 quid. <laughs> it was so expensive, I can't tell you. But now you could go to Tesco's <coughs> and buy a DVD player for 15 quid. Mm. Yeah? So innovation in technology over that mm. time brings the price down. And if we did that for housing, I think it would make a massive yeah. difference. Can I interrupt you there a minute? Because um, Paul Handley, have we got Paul Handley in the room? Paul, yeah. Good question. I'll, I'll let you ask it if you want, or I will. But, well, no, but linked very closely to innovation is obviously creativity. Mm -hmm. And we are, as a subject area, about developing creativity. Paul, do you want to ask your question? 
can't remember it. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was <laughs> so poignant. You, you, you asked, and it's a good one. You, you, you asked, it's a good one. What do you think is the more, most important aspect of developing creativity? How can we encourage the development of creativity in the pupils we speak think, to? I think it's by, uh, and this might sound like an obvious answer, but I think it's about making um, something exciting to people. And my kids are brilliant as at being a gauge of that. If I see them, if they genuinely walk into the space and get stimulated and excited by something, they become really engaged. If they mm. become engaged, they become really interested and they want to learn more and more. It's like having a good teacher, isn't it? If you've got a teacher who's really exciting and stimulating and all of a sudden you're, like, you're engaged, you're, you want to be part of that. If that teacher's rubbish, you just don't connect. And... I, I took my daughter to New York recently and we went into um, a kind of gallery and that gallery, it, was a, it felt a bit ye olde and dusty when you went round it initially. It, you know, it was, a, it was a bit, it was kind of, it was a little bit old school. And then, and it was all about homes. It's all about home design and things like that. I mean, I quite enjoyed it, but I could see my daughter thinking, you know, my dad's dragged me around another museum about housing. And uh, we walked into this one room, and it was all black, completely black in the room. And there was a, like, interactive board with a couple of pens there. And I was like, what the hell's that? And um, you could basically, you could sketch and draw on this board. And as you did it, you were designing a wallpaper. Wallpaper's becoming a theme for this talk, I've just realised. <laughs> as you did it your image that you were drawing that big was instantly replicated mm. thousands of times on all the walls in that room. Mm. And you could just erase it and then design another one. So you were wallpaper in a room <coughs> in kind of technology in this wonderful design in seconds. I couldn't get her out of that space for love nor money. Mm. She designed and designed and designed and designed all the time. Mm. All sorts of different ideas coming out. She designed one about her name. She did another one about music. Mm. And so just through that little bit of and it's not just about technology, it's actually just about being stimulated by something. You know, it could be a straightforward pen and mm. a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I, think if you can just, yeah, I think if you just engage... Our kids now are highly stimulated when you think about it. iPhones, iPads, you know, you could even argue that they're overstimulated in some ways and you've got to kind of pull them back from that. Um, there's a concern generally, I think, that kids' attention spans are getting less. I call it the YouTube effect. Well, YouTube have decided that film should be no more than like four or five minutes because no one wants to watch it for longer than that. It's like, mm. what? To say that, I put, there's a, I'm plugging too many things now. Go on to Netflix, right? It's the coolest TV series I've seen in years. No, it's called Abstract. You heard about it? It was launched in February this year by Netflix, made by Abstract, right? And they've decided to make a one hour program about someone creative, yeah? And one's an illustrator. Um, who's an amazing guy called Christoph Nyman. He's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. Um, the second one, which is awesome, is about Tinker Hatfield. Mm -hmm. Tinker Hatfield revolutionised Nike. Mm -hmm. He designed the Jordan Nike Airs. He's, you know, he's, the guy is like a god, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's a young architect on one of them. Now, my daughter, when we're in New York, she said, what are you watching? I said, I'm watching this thing called Abstract. She took my iPad and she watched all eight episodes in one day in New York. Now, she's nine years old, yeah? So it's not just about technology, it's about great creative yeah. content that stimulates okay. people. Okay, that's good. I think, you, I think I caught you talking about making things then. I know making was a very important part of your early career, certainly, or your early life yeah. as, a, as, as a boy. We've got, we've got Andrew in the room. Andrew with nice writing. He hasn't given me a, a surname. Maybe I'll ask it for you, but uh, maybe we've got more I think with more nice writing would be a great Andrew, surname. Got, yeah, it would. It. Andrew, do you want to ask your question? What's your most memorable meeting project? <laughs> oh my God, that's a great question. That's a brilliant question. Oh, it was awful. That's why I remember it so well. I made a bathroom cabinet. And it was like some weird design. It was terrible when I think about it. I did, they, they said you had to push yourself in terms of design, so I basically set so many angles to make this bathroom cabinet out of it. It was like some kind of fractal, crazy bit of geometry, and it was the hardest thing to ever make. I realised how bad I was at joinery 
through that project. So yes, it was a bathroom cabinet. I'm not going to talk about it much more because I'm too embarrassed <laughs> by it. That's the most memorable thing anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and luckily it's, it disappeared. I don't know where it even went yeah, to. It just, yeah. someone must have thought it was so bad they might have put it in a skip. Yeah. I don't know whether you'd agree with, with us, George, but I know there will be a lot of people in the room here as D&T teachers um, and poss possibly art and design teachers who suffer all the time from people who don't do those things not getting it. They just don't get it. They don't get the creative bit. They don't get the innovation bit. Polly, have we got Polly in the room here? Hello. Hi, Polly. Good question. Polly, can you remember what you, you asked? Do you want to put it? Excellent. <laughs> it's beautiful writing. It is beautiful Everyone's writing. Everyone's got nice writing in the room. That's a good sign. Polly, ask your question. Do, do, we need a, do we have a mic or can... Speak up, maybe. Speak up. I'm quite loud. Yeah, I think you'll be fine. Go ahead. Right. Um, how can we put art and design technology nearer the forefront of the national system? Because that's really why we're all here. We're all about educating the future. Yeah. And that's how do we get people to value it? No, no, I was just thinking because it's, um, you know, there's obviously lots of ways that you can approach it, whether it's political, whether it's debate, whether it's, you know, raising awareness and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, I think more than anything, it's about how, how can we... I mean, I don't have any control over the national curriculum. I wish I did. <laughs> um, so there's, there's powers that be out there who, who would need to make the decision way over my head. But I think, I think it's about schools and parents really valuing what that gives to their kids. Um, unfortunately, we're in a system where it's maths and English, maths and English, maths and English, maths and English, because mm. we've got to you know, tick every box on every league table. And I think the problem with that is that we, we, we've kind of devalued art and design. And that's shocking when you think about it, because some of the best innovators we've got in this country have come from a kind of art design, product design background. Mm. How we do it, I, I genuinely don't know, because I don't know whether you're talking about lobbying governments and lobbying policy at that level. Will they listen? I've got absolutely no idea. Uh, maybe it's up to us to, to start to really genuinely demonstrate what that value actually really is. I mean, this, you know, maybe we should get some company who's very good at stats and figures to, to look at I don't know how much GDP has improved in Britain through art and design. I don't know if, I don't know if like, the Office for National Statistics have got that. And somebody out there somewhere must be able to calculate the value of GDP added mm. through the creative industries. Mm. I, I've, I, mean, I've I can give you the figure. I yeah, can't um, remember it. But no, but, it, but it's, 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 massive. That, it's that sort of stuff I think that people need. It. I mean, the fact that I don't know is probably a good example of how that message isn't getting out there. You know, I should probably know that. And I don't know it. And if I don't know it, then there's something wrong. Um, so maybe it is up to us a little bit to demonstrate that. I mean, you know, if you wanted some help to get the message out there, I'd be willing to do it. Um, okay. Because I think we've got to demonstrate value. Mm. Unfortunately, we live in a time where everything's accountable. Everything's accountable all the time. Um, I, I had to put figures together on some restoration work we were doing about the value of restoration to our old buildings. Because actually in the 1950s and 60s, we didn't value our old buildings. Mm. In fact, it was the complete opposite. Get rid of the old, make way for the new. You know, get rid of that station, let's build a flash new one. Get rid of those houses, let's build some 1960s tower blocks. And we didn't value history. Well, if you think where we are now, National Trust, English Heritage, CADU, you know, we look at St. Pancras Station. It's one of the most incredible mm. restoration projects in the world. A mm. fantastic piece of regeneration. <laughs> They were going to demolish that. John Betjeman saved it. John Betjeman started off a campaign and formed Save to save St Pancras Station. Mm. And thank God he did. It's a brilliant gateway to London and, and to Europe. <coughs> um, and there's a value based on that. So I, 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 could, I could actively demonstrate that the 125 billion was going into the economy through a restoration project. And all Same buildings. architect as Leeds, <coughs> Leeds Royal Infirmary as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I Beautiful think, building. Demonstrating value, but maybe it's up to us to do that. Yeah. Um, you've answered a lot of the questions in a roundabout sort of way already, because you, you've given us a script, but there may be a couple of burning things that have come out, which, if you don't mind, George, no, no. will we'll give people the opportunity. You were first. May I ask a follow-up to that? Because I think it's a really good question. Um, 
which is the reverse. What do you think the um, effect would be of taking design and technology out of the core subjects because of EVAC? So you did it to GCSE O-level and that and that was able to go to <coughs> That's not being taken up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's damaging if it gets taken out, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's shocking, really, to be honest. I think, um, I think we're being too prescriptive about what we think people should be doing rather than actually giving them the freedom and more choice and more options to make their own decisions, really. I think it's, it's awful. You know, it's just not right, to be honest. Design, for me, is such a... It's interesting, when I set up Moby, we've had massive conversations about the culture of Moby and what that's going to be and how it's going to work. And it still amazes me how some people just think design is drawing a few pretty pictures and, and you know, making something look good. And obviously we can talk about the, the iPhone being a nice piece of design and it is. But um, for me, design's a much more of a cultural thing. Mm. You know, it's mm. much bigger than just drawing something and just making something. It's much bigger than that. And I've been having conversations with people who are on the edges of the design industry where I've gone, come on, it's more than that. It's way more than that, you know? Yeah. And my daughter, I'll keep talking about that, my daughter, my daughter said to me after she watched Abstract and we walked around the streets of New York and she looked at me and she went, Dad, design is everything, isn't it? Mm. And that, I don't mean that in a kind of arrogant way, but she, she just said it to me and I went, oh my God. and I went, yeah, you're right. And her point was, because that car's been designed and that footpath's been designed and that door handle's been designed and that building's been designed and my pair clip's been designed and my trainers have been designed, mm. everything's been designed. Mm. And that's, <laughs> that's where we can link value with justifying mm. what George, one of the things we've been talking about in school design and technology education recently, uh, and it's now written into the new GCSEs, is, is design is very much about risk-taking. And someone asked, I'll, I'll read it out, but someone asked the question, what's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Oh, God. As a designer. <laughs> <laughs> I think every day is a risk, isn't it? I think every mark you make on a piece of paper is a risk. I mean, I really believe that. You know, that's why I'm seeing with every, like the Hong Kong projects, mm. every mark that I made... Mm. had an implication, it had an impact. Mm. And you had to be fairly confident mm. that that mark was considered and, and what it would do and what impact it would have on people's lives. I find it, I, mm. I mean, I, I enjoy design, but I'm scared by it at the same time because mm. you're always jumping in with both feet. Mm. Sometimes I'm jumping in on things that I feel mm. like I haven't got experience in. Mm. And sometimes it's about failure, isn't it? It's always about failure. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't learn from your successes, you learn from your mistakes. Mm. You learn a bit mm. from your successes. Mm. It's interesting, actually, that the, the successes that we've had is probably through making lots of mistakes. Mm. You know, where you kind of, you realise it's just not right, and then you've got to go again and go again and go again. And, and to be honest, even when I've drawn something and it's been built, I'm still not convinced it's right. Mm. It's just because I've been given that deadline and it's just, that's it, you know. I think on that note, you've just described design and technology and the processes that we encourage students and teach students to go through on a daily basis and now finally have really got acknowledged as part of the new suite or the new GCSE single title design and technology, <coughs> which actually celebrates taking risks, uh, some sort of iterative process, trying something out, thinking about it, doing something. We've now got that recognised so that the prototypes that students are making don't necessarily have to work to be examples of good design and technology. Well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I could get in trouble for saying this. Some of the most arrogant designers I know do the worst products. <laughs> and actually some of the most humble, fearful, petrified designers I know design some okay. really beautiful things. Mm. because they're in, a, they're in a particular mindset where they <coughs> mm. kind of worry a little bit and they are a little bit scared and there's a little bit of fear mm. there and it pushes them on to do mm. better and better. Mm. The arrogant architect is, mm. a, is a dangerous thing. <laughs> Very dangerous.
Maybe that's a thought for us to take home with, uh, go home with this evening. George, before you go, I just want to, um, to give some, um, some thanks. It's been wonderful that you've been able to come here and, and give so freely of your time. It's been fascinating, hasn't it? Um, I'd also very much like to thank uh, the Royal Commission, Royal uh, 1851 Commission. <laughs> also, thanks to um, Imperial College for um, allowing us to and um, hosting the event here as well. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. If you've got ideas, I'm not saying we can definitely do more of these, but we're look forever looking for sponsorship. I think they play a very valuable contribution to developing our thinking about the subject. Of course, as well as the people in the room, George, this is being streamed, so other people have, have, have heard Which it. Which is why I'm going to get in trouble for telling you yeah, about I Wolby. I did think of that when you mentioned it, but yeah. there you go. Oh, um, yes. We might be able to edit that bit out, if that Don't would worry. help. Uh, but uh, if you have ideas for future speakers, and I think now, particularly because we've had three men, we ought to follow this up with three Oops. women. Uh, and it would be good to hear who you think um, they might be. But thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. But first, uh, but last but not least, George, thank you very much oh indeed.